Good afternoon, friends, and shalom, and blessings to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sorry, i got to adjust the camera there real, real quick. Uh, welcome to this episode of Unapologetics, the show where we are unapologetic about apologetics, and I am your host, CJ Cox. Want to give some shout-outs to those of you who are in the live chat currently. I see Peter W., Jamie Russell, Frost, uh, Yahoo is here. Shalom, thank you very much for being here. Uh, looks like Veckel and Ryan, the Presbyterian, were at least here earlier. I don't know if you guys are still here, but nevertheless, if you are, Shalom, thank you very much for being here. Um, if you are here, please remember to like and share this video, and please consider subscribing to the channel if you have not done so. Hit the bell to get notified every time that we go live and leave any questions, comments, criticisms, concerns, critiques, or anything of that sea starting nature in the comment section down below. Uh, or, of course, here in the live chat if you are actually watching us live. Um, <clears throat> if you guys are going to ask questions here live, um, mods, try to collect them if you can, and then we'll answer kind of at the end. Remember that it's easier for us to answer Super Chats, so any Super Chats do not only get first priority, but guarantee of being answered. Uh, and I appreciate anybody who is asking any questions in any capacity. Uh, if you'd like to follow us on various social media platforms, you can do so. I'm on Gab, Parlor, Facebook, Minds, Twitter, and Truth Social at the tag, The Synagogue. Uh, different display names on pretty much each of those websites, but nevertheless, you can find me at the tag, The Synagogue on any of those. Get this video shared there if you fancy, and I certainly appreciate anybody who is joining us there as well. Uh, I see Sola Scriptura has also joined us. Thank you for being here, brother. Um, also, if you guys would like to contribute to the work that we're doing, you can do so either by giving super chats, super stickers, or super thanks, or by becoming channel members, or by donating either one time to the PayPal or monthly to the Patreon. We, of course, ask that you give using trepidation. We don't want to be part of the endless glut of content that doesn't edify anybody or glorify uh, our Lord. But if this is content which you think does accomplish those things, then please do consider uh, helping us to get the reach out here and, and turn this into a, a full-time apologetics ministry. And we appreciate anybody who's doing that. Um, want to uh, let you guys know about a couple debates we have planned. Uh, so June the 17th, I will be debating Charles Jennings of the Layman's Seminary. And we are going to be discussing James chapter 2. That's going to be on Standing for Truth's channel. I believe it's going to be about 6 p.m. Mountain Time on June 17th, but nevertheless, we'll be debating the free grace versus lordship interpretation of James chapter 2. Uh, it'll be my second debate with Charles. I know a lot of people very much enjoyed the first one, so that'll uh, definitely be a, a nice thing to get started here. As you guys know, I've been somewhat railing against free grace recently, and will continue to do so. But nevertheless, um, you know, I want to uh, go ahead and let you guys know about that. Also, on August the 17th, tentatively, I may be debating uh, Ricky Caldwell over on the Gospel Truth YouTube channel, and we'll be discussing the issue of um, whether or not Christians are in any capacity supposed to be obedient to the law. Uh, Ricky Caldwell takes the what is known as New Covenant Theology perspective, popularized by people like Douglas Moo. I take your standard Westminster Confession perspective that says the moral law is binding always, ceremonial law is fulfilled and binding in its fulfilled capacity, and civil law is binding in so much as the general equity has any sort of binding upon us. Uh, so that should be a very interesting debate. The really interesting thing about it is that both me and Caldwell are reformed, right? And um, typically, you when you have this kind of debate, it's like modern evangelical and Hebrew roots or something like that, right? But instead, we have two different perspectives within the reformed camp. So that'll be very interesting as well. Uh, and other than that, so far, we have other debates we're planning, but nothing set in stone. Last thing I want to remind you guys of is, remember, please be on the lookout for uh, the work we're going to be publishing here soon. <clears throat> 18 questions for the Reformed answered. Uh, it is my attempt at eight, answering 18 of the most common objections to Reformed theology. If you guys are interested in that, uh, hopefully that should be published here within a month or so. It was supposed to be published last month, but nevertheless, we ran into some hangups. Um, if you are a Calvinist who just wants to have some easy to digest answers to these questions or a non-Calvinist who wants to see how a Calvinist answers these questions or just want to be a part of the dialogue, whatever reason you'd like, uh, please do consider being on the lookout for that work. And I hope that everybody is edified by it when we finally do get it published. Um, that's pretty much all for the announcements. So we're going to go ahead and jump into our prayer for today. 
and then we are going to jump to this conversation. we got a very special guest here today. I think it's going to be a very excellent conversation, but nevertheless, let's go ahead and jump into our prayer, and then we will get started here. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the opportunity once again to be doing these videos, Lord Jesus, and to be trying our best, Lord Jesus, to understand that which you have revealed to us, Lord. I pray that you give everybody here the, that portion that you choose to give us here today, Lord Jesus, that anointing of the Holy Spirit that allows us to be defending truth where we need to stand firm and, and has us being receptive to truth whenever it's being spoken to us, Lord Jesus, and not just here for the speakers, but the audience as well. I pray that all of us are just here wanting to receive whatever it is that you may want to put on our hearts, Lord Jesus. We know that you are an active and living God and that your scriptures are scriptures for all time, Lord Jesus. So just put us to the side, Lord Jesus, and, and allow us to glorify your name if it be your will. I ask these things in Jesus Christ's name and we give you the glory. Amen. All right. Friends, I am joined here today by Kevin Thompson of Beyond the Fundament, uh, Fundamentals. If you guys are unaware of who that is, which I kind of doubt, but nevertheless, uh, he is going to go ahead and um, let us know a little bit about himself. So um, shalom, Mr. Thompson, and thank you very much for being here. Um, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, yeah, and anything, anything you'd like to plug or anything like that as well. We're simulcasting this, by the way, guys, so he may also want to address his own audience here. So if that sounds weird, that's why. Yeah, this is uh, I've never done this before. We're trying to live stream to two different channels, but uh, yeah, CJ reached out to me and asked if I wanted to debate. And for those of you in my audience, you know that we don't, uh, we try not to do the debate modality. So I told him I have a discussion. So here we are. I appreciate you inviting me to come on. Uh, as far as my background is concerned, I have a degree in theology from the University of Mobile. I was an army officer for 15 years as a signal officer. I actually was trying to be a chaplain until we invaded Iraq and because I was already branch qualified as a signal officer. They told me to pack my bags and uh, go to Fort Hood and go to Iraq. So I <laughs> did that for a while and uh, pastored some churches along the way. And I was always helping churches out along the way. Um, actually, right before that happened, I, I got uh, while I got my theology degree, I spent some time as a Calvinist. All my professors, well, except for one. My my main professors that I saw most of the time, they were Calvinists. I was a youth pastor serving under a Calvinist pastor, and uh, they effectively persuaded me that Calvinism was true, and that lasted about a year and a half until, um, yeah, it lasted about a year and a half, and uh, I was, one of the reasons I do content about Calvinism is because I was absolutely astonished about how somebody could come to believe these things when it's so easily refutable. Uh, and so I'm, I'm on a journey. I'm on a discovery mission. Like what is it that makes people susceptible to deception of any kind, not just Calvinism? What is it that uh, makes people vulnerable to these things? What are the, what are the underlying conditions? What are the preconditions um, that lead to deception, self-deception, and the inability to function in the world. And then as I, the more I dig into this, the more I realize that there are the underlying causes that result in Calvinism are shared by people in free grace and provisionism and Arminianism. There's, there's a lot of commonalities where a lot of vulnerabilities are shared. So I've, I've come to the conclusion that just leaving Calvinism and making a lateral move over to something like provisionism really isn't enough. And so I'm exploring how, uh, you know, how far the rabbit trail goes. That's what I've been doing lately on the channel. Um, just exploring everything that God has for us in scripture and in his creation. All right. And thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> and so as you may be able to guess, given the introductions there, our conversation will be primarily pertaining to Calvinism. So we're going to be discussing basically um, some of the reasons to or to not believe Calvinism. Of course, as you guys know, I am Reformed. Uh, so this will, I think, be a very excellent conversation. We've had a couple conversations with um, non-Calvinists before 
uh, namely Leighton Flowers and Dan Chapa. Uh, but I think that nevertheless, it will be for us to have here. And I'm very appreciative of Mr. Thompson for joining us. So um, <clears throat> there's a lot of different directions, I guess we could go. Um, a lot of the more common objections to uh, Calvinism are things that I would certainly like to bring up, but I guess what would probably be better is to have you maybe present some of the objections and explain why you think they're good objections. And then we can kind of start from there being that you are the guest. Um, and it's possible I can oh, bring I thought, up something. I thought you were going to interview me. <laughs> well, it is, it is an interview, right? It's just, it was more of a, I guess it's more of a general discussion, right? Um, so we can do it either way, I guess. Yeah, I, I can, I can lead off. Yeah. If you want. So, um, go ahead. Yeah. So I was just going to say it, it, um, the main reason I was wanting to see about maybe some of the objections you might want to bring up is just so I, we don't, you know, accidentally spend too much time on stuff that we might agree on potentially. Uh, because, right. you know, like, like, for example, if I were to, and I'm not saying you agree or disagree with this, but let, you know, let's say that I were to speak about perseverance of the saints and you're like, well, I agree with perseverance of the saints. Be like, okay, well that was a rabbit trail. We just would kind of waste. Right. So, um, and again, whether you do or don't, I don't, I don't necessarily know, but nevertheless, so I, if you have a, maybe just like a small list of things you think are objectionable, and I could even steer from there. We could kind of just <laughs> end the topic. You know what I mean? Yeah. So well, let me start with my overall approach. Um, with regard to God being infinite, uh, that we are beings of finite transcendence. And what that means is no matter, we're never going to transcend. We're never going to transform. You know, Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation is a wonderful thing. We should all strive for it. We should all be pressing for that mark. But no matter how much you transform, there is always essentially God ahead of you. There is the infinite ahead of you, and you're never going to reach there, like Paul said, not as though I had already attained. So there is there is an infinite amount of information or experience ahead of us. Therefore, it is an act of hubris to settle on any particular list of beliefs and emotionally attach ourselves to them and claim that those things are true. Because now that's difficult for some people to hear because, well, what about the basics? Like, you know, Jesus came, he's born of a virgin, he died and rose again. And, and I get that. We have to have certain things as core, you know, the the center of the meme complex, if you will, and, and that's the narrative off which we operate. However, there isn't a place in Scripture where any of the apostles or Jesus tells us, hey, I want you to compile a list of beliefs, and I want you to um, emotionally attach yourself to them, identify with them, and then never grow after that. And then I want you to measure how good of a Christian you are by how much you ascend within the hierarchy of an in-group that is normalized by affirmation of said beliefs and by how cleverly people can generate post hoc rationalizations to defend those beliefs. And those who can do it the best ascend to the top. There's, we never see anybody commanding us to do that, but we do that. That's, that's what institutional Christianity has become, and it's become a huge problem. And when I say this, this is any, you know, provisionists are in the same boat as Calvinists with this regard to settle on a list of static propositional conclusions and say that this is the list and then you, and we're going to define orthodoxy and heresy by how much fidelity you demonstrate to this list. Who do we think we are? Who do we think we are in the face and the presence of an almighty God who is infinitely higher than us to stop with a closed mind and make statements about what we think is absolutely true in a propositional sense when we have no experience to base it on, no episodic memory of the things, and we make all these dogmas, statements of faith, and confessions of faith 
entering into those things which we have not seen, vainly puffed up by the imagination of our fleshly mind, like Colossians chapter 2, verse 18 says. So on the surface, my main objection to Calvinism is the same as my objection to provisionism or anything else, and that is having DF, making an idol out of a list of propositional dogmatic beliefs stultifies any attempt to grow to be more like Christ. And it is, it constitutes profanity. And when I say the word profanity, what I mean is disorientation. So the sacred is that which orients. And we might say, we might agree that scripture is sacred or the Holy Spirit is sacred. That That is the kind of thing which orients us and we should be oriented toward something. Well, being oriented toward identifying yourself with a list of static propositional dogmatic conclusive beliefs is disorientation. It necessarily inhibits any growth and it becomes idolatry. So my first main objection to any any kind of system like that would would be that it's fundamentally profane. That's an interesting one. Um, and I actually, I have heard you bring that one up before. I think if I remember correctly, you brought that up in your interview with Leighton Flowers, if I remember correctly. Um, Probably. You've been on there a couple times. Um, so I am remind. first off, I do want to say there's a little bit of agreement in so much as that, you know, I think Christians should always be ready to be persuaded by the truth. Certainly. Um, the, you know, whether that be the, the truth of scripture itself, or even just the truth, the, the, excuse me, wow. The truth of reality yeah. outside of, uh, scripture, right. Um, of course, not in any way which would contradict scripture, but nevertheless, you know, that, that is something that we should be open to as pursuers of the truth. So I have a little bit of agreement with that. Um, I am also reminded of an Augustine quote where he says something to the effect of an open mind is like a open mouth meant to close on something. Um, and that's a paraphrase of the quote uh, itself filtered through Doug Wilson. But nevertheless, the point that he's trying to make there is to say, you know, there is, there comes a point in time where if you're, if you're constantly open-minded and never actually coming to a conclusion as far as what the truth actually is, um, that it's almost kind of like the, what is the verse where he says, ever learning but never coming to knowledge of the truth? You know, it, it's somewhat similar to that kind of vein, right? So in that sort of, in, in the vein of that quote, I guess I would want to ask, do you think it is justified for a Christian once they have come to the truth on some manner or, or another? And for the, for the current moment, we're just assuming that they have indeed done so, because of course we can get into whether or not they have indeed done so. Um, are they justified at that point in saying, okay, this is the truth, and therefore that which is contradictory to this is of necessity not the truth? Like, for example, the deity of Christ, right? We The scripture is quite clear on the deity of Christ. So do you think we're justified in saying, all right, those who, who are rejecting the deity of Christ, say the Jehovah's Witness, for example, are affirming that A is in fact not A, that's a contradiction, and, and we can't um, we can't accept that because we know what the truth is, right? Do you think that that's a fair thing to do? Well, there's so many, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask some first principles questions and I may come across to some people as if I'm being obtuse. So I'm going to tell you up front that I'm really not, I'm really not. So when it comes to the deity of Christ, what is a deity? And if someone says, I affirm the deity of Christ, and in their mind, they're thinking of, well, Thor is a deity and Christ is like that. They can say those words, but those words don't mean anything, at least not anything that a typical Christian would agree with, but they don't know that because they're using the same vocabulary to point to two different things, which brings up the trouble with words in general. Words are only pointers at things. There's a story of a guy who was dying in battle, oh, about 600 BC. So it's back in the day, right? He's got an arrow in his heart. And the physician comes up to him, the army's physician comes up and he's like, we need to get this arrow out now. 
and then we need to operate on you so that you can live. And the sooner we get it out, the better. And they're about to pull it out, and the guy stops him and says, hold on, what's the arrow made out of? Who shot the arrow? What's the metal made out of? He asks all these questions, and the physician says, well, um, we, we need to get this arrow out. Um, you, you could get the answer to all these questions, but you're going to die. So if he were to arrive at the truth of what the arrow was made out of, should he not have it pulled out? So this guy is fundamentally oriented toward the wrong kind of thing. Knowing what the arrow is made out of doesn't help save his life. And I think we have a similar problem. One of the, some of the examples that I constantly use on my channel, for instance, like surfing. Surfing takes a great deal of, especially surfing well, if you're going to ride a wave, and I'll, I'll be the first person to confess that I am, I'm no good at it. But if you're going to ride a wave, it takes a great degree of balance, takes a great degree of understanding experientially how physics works and the flow of water and how to be in attunement with it. If you were to memorize everything about the surfboard and everything about the water, then you still wouldn't be able to surf. So should I tell the surfer, you need to, you need to remain, keep an open mind that even though you think water is made of H2O with a few minerals and a 3.6 saline solution, you need to cope, keep an open mind that maybe it's made out of something else. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about um, lists of facts where people need to disagree and they normalize and form in-groups and out-groups based on who agrees with what facts. We're talking about the ability to perform an arena and you need to remain open to learning how to like procedural learning, how to better perform in an arena, which being oriented toward the collection of an emotional identity with facts, lists of facts is not oriented toward performing well. So it is, it is a fundamental disorientation away from what, we should be oriented toward. Yeah, and while I can certainly even sympathize with some of that as well, in so much as like, so for example, um, let's say, you know, being that I am reformed, if somebody is, is a firm believer in predestination, which I think is true, specifically the Calvinistic form of it, and they reject that Jesus Christ died for their sins, then clearly they have inordered loves, right? There, there's whatever that they're affirming something over here that ultimately is not going to lead to salvation while rejecting something that actually will lead to salvation, right? And so I, I can sympathize with this idea that, you know, like you say with the arrow, knowing what the wood is or what the metal's made out of is not going to save your life. Getting it out of your heart is going to save your life, right? But I also wonder, like, so once we're at that point, say you, you know, you have your surfer, your surfer is a good surfer, right? So they know how to surf at this point. Um, and other maybe peripheral questions about, you know, how to do, how to be surfing incredibly well. I would, I don't know if you guys do tricks in surfing. I'm not much of a, of a fan of that particular sport, but I assume you would, um, you know, wanting to know how to do certain tricks and stuff like that. Um, you know, at that point, so then you, you have those questions being asked apart from the fundamentals, certainly, and the fundamentals already being not necessarily affirmed in this case, but learned, right? So to, to keep the analogy now, if Who decides somebody, what the fundamentals are, well, and, and that's, that is certainly fair. Um, I guess I don't know, I would, if, you're, I don't know if you're familiar with the history of fundamentalism, but the George W. Dollar's book on the history of fundamentalism. They, they had initially a quorum on 26 different fundamentals, 26 of them, and then they narrowed it down to 19, and then they narrowed it down to 14, then 9, then down to 5. Mm -hmm. Why isn't it 26? Why isn't it 126? Isn't that kind of arbitrary? Is there a list? Well, Is there? I mean, are the, are the apostles telling us to orient, our, orient ourselves toward identifying fundamentals that can be propositionalized? Well, to a certain extent, I think, yes. Now, it is to a limited extent because certain things, like just 
with the example I was just giving there, I would not consider predestination to be a fundamental, which is why I can say, for example, my friend Dan Chapa, who's been on here before, I affirm him as a brother in Christ, even though he doesn't affirm Calvinism. He rejects it you know, wholeheartedly um, because I don't see that as I see it as truth, but I don't see it as something that's fundamental, meaning that gets him outside of the circle that is Christianity. Right. Um, but when we think about certain things like, is Jesus the Messiah? Did Jesus die for our sins? Is the scripture uh, his revealed word? Right. Um, those things, I think. You know, those are the, those are the, excuse me, those are the kinds of things that if you reject them, I don't know what kind of unity we actually have. And therefore, we can call them fundamentals or like the base foundation, right? Like if you if we're to say that, like the Muslim does, Jesus is the Messiah, but he's not God and he didn't die for your sins and he didn't die on the cross at all. Well, we don't have unity there because there's no agreement on just the base fundamental questions, right? Now, you would ask who defines what those are. I think the only way we can define what those are is by looking to Scripture and seeing if they, if the Scriptures define what those things are. And I think for the most part, they do. Um, there's some questions, certainly. Uh, I, I can sympathize with somebody who doesn't necessarily see the Trinity affirmed in a fundamentalist kind of way in the Scripture. Uh, and I can sympathize with the with the uh, other side of that, too. Somebody who says I'm a modalist, but I don't think that that's something that's necessarily a fundamental. You know, that's a question that took a lot of times, uh, you know, a lot of time to debate. But there's no question that Jesus is God from the scripture. And there's no question that he died for our sins in the scripture. There's no question that his word is is the revealed word of God in scripture. Right. It, uh, and, and I think certain things along those lines as well what it takes to be saved, believe on his name and submit to his lordship. Um, hmm. Which is another thing I think they I can remember that about. verse. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 13 uh, is the one I'm referencing. I think it's 13. Um, I'm familiar with that one. Of, anyway, go again. ahead. I said, I'm familiar with that one. Anyway, go ahead. So, but then assuming those things are, accepted right assuming that we both have we both believe that jesus christ is the same god of the bible so not not deity in the thoric sense right but deity in the jehovic sense right um and we both affirm that scripture is his word and we both affirm that by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves to give to god not a works lest any man should boast um you know we, we're in the same camp as far as those core things are concerned then we have other questions like okay why why are we determining camps by affirming propositions why are we doing that well i don't think we have a choice right like the, what what separates you from an orthodox jew is the acceptance of jesus christ as messiah right you guys agree I on practice volleyball you know? with the orthodox jews i'm in the in group with them so would you consider Orthodox Jews to be uh, saved in the biblical sense? I don't I don't make assessments on who is or who isn't saved. But I, I will say that Jesus that Christ um, is the only way to the Father. Okay, so that that's perfect, actually. That works well. So I won't have to rephrase it. That actually does suffice as an answer. So if they reject a, a hypothetical, not any individual, some hypothetical Orthodox Jew, rejects for his entire life that Jesus Christ is Lord or that God has a son of any kind or anything like that, right? Our assumption from scripture would be that that person is uh, not amongst the, not amongst the sheep, right? They're there amongst the goats or amongst the, the outside world. Well, or something. I think right? sheep and goats is a false dichotomy. When Jesus looks on lost people in Mark six thirty four. He doesn't see them as goats. He sees them as sheep without a shepherd. Goats are never mentioned in John chapter 10. There are sheep of my fold and sheep of other folds. Christ died for all the sheep. The sheep and goats comes in at the judgment of the nations in Matthew chapter 25. And uh, there are, there's never a time when sheep and goats is used to refer to individuals. So I guess we'd have a little different understanding of that I, i've always seen the uh the sheep and goats separation at the end as being separating those who are of christ's flock and those who are not of well, Christ's the, flock. the problem is the criteria of separation is works so if we're going to speak in terms of sheep and goats referring to people who are saved and lost 
then we would also be uh, implying an affirmation to works-based salvation because that is the criteria for who the sheep are and who the goats are in Matthew 25. And I don't affirm a works-based salvation. I'm not sure if you do. I don't, but I am curious. Um, if if not, we can just ignore this to, for the sake of, of more edifying conversation. But if yes, uh, this... sorry, my uh, screen went out there. I don't know what happened. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. We're good. That was weird. Um, so, um, do you affirm a, a lordship salvation? In other words, do you think that uh, fruit necessarily derives from a Christian life or that repentance is necessary for salvation? Do I say that's a, I typically it's in, you know, I see people in the chat that's evasive, Kevin, that kind of thing. And it's going to sound evasive when I say this, but we do not make, we very intentionally on our channel, in our FSI group, we avoid affirming and disaffirming things uh, because there's so many reasons. There's so many things that we might be misunderstanding when we say certain things, all right? Um, let, me, let me say this. Christ is the name of Jesus. It means Jehovah is salvation. Right. Um, or Jehovah saves, something like that. Jehovah is... It could be translated, you know, Jehovah, the Tetragrammaton, Yad Heh Vad Heh, I am that I am, or or the problem with that, the, there's actually a grammatical incor incorrection in the Tetragrammaton, and the I am that I am is actually past, present, and future tense. I, I was is will, that I was is will, something like that is what's going on. Um, it's it's a multi tense being word, and also if you pronounce it Yahweh, that is a breath, a breath, Jehovah. So Jehovah ultimately is being Jesus. Jehovah is salvation. Being, being is what salvages. Jesus is the archetypal picture of what being is, and what Jesus Christ did is he voluntarily adopted responsibility for things that are not his problem, like our sins. He died. He bore the cost of that responsibility when he didn't have to. And he rose again with a resurrection cycle, making things better off in the after part than they were to begin with after having borne the responsibility of somebody else's, that was somebody else's fault, doing all this in charity, above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, Colossians chapter three, verse 14. So Jesus being salvation is a, uh, it's not just something that pertains to the afterlife. It's something that permeates every micro, meso, macro level of reality, of time. If, if I'm going to salvage something, it's going to be through Jesus Christ. I'm going to follow the pattern. If I'm going to clean up my office, I'm going to follow that pattern. I'm going to voluntarily adopt responsibility to take on a task. I'm going to bear the burden of that. And in the end, there's going to be a resurrection cycle and I do so out of a charitable disposition to my future self. So there is no good thing that can possibly happen without that pattern being followed. And it is in alignment with the pattern of Jesus Christ through which salvation comes to any moment or any life or any afterlife. And there are no exceptions. There is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ, not even for a split second not even for a moment. Now, when Paul says not by works, he's specifically referring to the deeds of the law in Romans chapter three, verse 20, Romans chapter three, verse 28. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. And then the phrase is added in Romans three twenty in his sight. 
<clears throat> so when Paul is talking about not by works, there's this, I'm just giving my opinion here and you know, all the, all the ideologically possessed naysayers will, you know, where did you get that from? What scholar says, I know what's coming. And I'm just asking people to think for a second, but essentially what is the proper thing for any particular person to do cannot be prescribed. One of the problems we have in our society is we try to, we overestimate our ability to pre-specify relevance. And that's why we have all kinds of dates and rules and regulations that wind up out of date. And in Christianity, we've taken the Old Testament law and we've essentially replaced it with what is more or less a New Testament law, something like a systematic theology. We're replacing it rather than transcending it through Christ. And what Paul is essentially saying is that there is no exact prescription of works that I can pre-assign you that is associated with salvation. But through Christ comes wisdom, and those who are in Christ, there is going to be, uh, like a surfer, movement that is in attunement with Christ. But, it's, but it can't be pre-prescribed. All things are lawful for me, not all things are expedient. Those who are growing in the wisdom of Christ are learning what is appropriate and expedient, and expedient in the moment that cannot be pre-prescribed. So then I guess to, to rephrase the question that in a sense that would perhaps fit into, um, fit into the parameters you're, you're giving here, do you think if a man is saved, if a man becomes regenerate, the Holy Spirit dwells within that man, uh, do you believe that that man will change his behavior to such an extent, now, not for salvation, he's already been saved, right? This is after the fact. Do you believe that man will change his behavior in such a way that he is starting to line up more and more with the principles or spirit behind God, God's law, his teachings, things of that nature? In other okay. words, like if I have a, an issue with lusting after women, do you think that by being saved, I will become over time less and less inclined to do that by the power of God's spirit. So we, there's a whole bunch of premises that are built in here. So let me combine both of these questions in the way they are here. If, first of all, if, if there is a person who is affirming Lordship salvation, uh, like John MacArthur or somebody like that, that is absolute profanity. It is absolute profanity. Every time I've seen that preached from somewhere, what the people have in mind, and, and Calvin, Calvin himself even did this, is that when you have, uh, you could say perseverance of the saints, and a lot of people think that perseverance of the saints is interchangeable with eternal security, and it absolutely is not. The perseverance of the saints is the belief that those who are truly elect will persevere in faith and good works. Um, eternal security in Calvinism actually is tied to unconditional election. Perseverance of the saints is tied to the behavior of those who have been unconditionally elected after they are regenerated. And whenever people are talking about perseverance of the saints, which is another way of saying lordship salvation, what they typically have in mind is they have a pre-prescribed set of actions that a person is expected to follow or we as a group get to doubt whether or not you're really saved or if you're elect you know in the gnostic sense whether or not you've yet been yet to be regenerated so it's a way to control people it's a way to keep people in doubt it's a way people to get make people keep doubting their salvation calvin did this uh in geneva uh calvinists have been doing this non-calvinists have been doing this so you either have the threat of if you don't behave and the, and the implied thing is in accordance with the list of rules that we have laid out, if you don't behave, then you're not really one of us and we're going to excommunicate you. Or if you don't behave, you lose your salvation. Either way, the person goes from thinking they were saved to now thinking they are not saved based on their behavior, which in a very microcosmic way is what you, as you just suggested in the specific case of lust, 
you listed a particular disposition toward the idea of lust and women, which could be used as a metric for whether or not somebody is saved or for whether or not somebody has grown. Okay. And I think that holding up certain metrics like this is, is also profane. Okay. And I have a video on my channel where I'm reviewing the movie World War One, uh, World War Z. I'm sorry, <laughs> World War Z, and it's a Brad Pitt movie, and it kind of seems like a zombie apocalypse movie. And in one way, it is, but in, if you look at it from a different way, it's actually a depiction of somebody who is breaking all the normal rules of society. But when he does so, it is appropriate for him to do so. Um, and a couple of examples of that early in the movie, he steals an RV. Well, everyone would think that's pretty, pretty wrong, but in that scenario, it was the right thing to do. He thinks he might be infected. So instead of killing his family, he jumps up on a building and he's ready to commit suicide. Well, we all think that committing suicide is wrong, but if you're going to turn into a monster, that's going to kill your family. In that case, it would be correct. Okay. Later on, somebody gets bit on the arm and he pulls out a knife and chops this woman's arm off. Well, most of the time, we would think that that's a horrible thing to do to somebody. But in that situation, it was the right thing to do. So it's almost like that movie is really a depiction of how everything that is wrong to do normally in a Kronos environment at some point in time becomes the right thing to do, but not in any way that can be pre-specified. So when Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient, it's kind of like we're in that movie and we have to, through the wisdom of Christ, address what is appropriate for that moment. And the problem is people who are not spiritual cannot fathom compliance with Christ without having a list that they affirm that they can use to control other people. So it's really a... um. It's an having. It's really an indication of uh, immaturity, lack of spirituality, and possibly even cluster B personality disorders when people resort to this kind of thing. So I, I think the the main issue that I kind of have with that, and I can there's some some sympathy I can have with it in so much as that, um, you know, there's the famous dilemma of a guy who had you know the nazis knock at his door and he has jews under the floorboard does he sin by lying or does he sin by giving them up and the, it's supposed to be a dilemma both options are supposed to be sinful right right and now. most of us would say that the option to lie is the better option I, i'm sure somebody out there says the other option is better um but for the most part i think the the majority of people affirm the uh that you know lying to the authorities there is is the better of the two options right um, of course, you're only in the situation where either choice you have is from an objective standpoint against God's law because outside sinners have put you in that position, right? Or, or we can even be broader than that and say outside circumstances. In other words, it's not that lying is suddenly okay. It's just that we're in a fallen world. And as a result, it is possible for you to have two bad options and one bad option be worse than the other, and therefore one bad option be more in line with what God would, would desire than the other, right? That certainly is a possible uh, 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 a See, there's a presumption. There's an underlying presumption there. And somebody in the comment says Kevin is preaching cheap antinomianism, and that's absolutely the opposite of what I'm doing. It's, it's um, People want to have, essentially people want to be part of the hierarchy of the in-group that it gets to control and and uh dictate people's behavior and whenever they whenever christ has control of you rather than the in-group rather than the man-made in-group people object to that kind of thing so if we were to like in the rahab is in the hall of faith hebrews 11 she's mentioned there essentially for lying okay right um it you know i have the <laughs> Everyone probably thinks it's a great thing that Saddam Hussein was captured. You know, I happen to be friends with the intelligence officer who paid hookers to sleep with his top advisors to find out where he was through pillow talk. So do we still think it's a great thing that we found him and caught him? 
this kind of thing is going on all the time. And it's, it's actually a great example to go back and talk about this issue of, of lust, okay? Because you mentioned the issue of lust a few minutes ago. Now, based on the comments that I'm seeing from people on your channel, they are not going to understand what I'm going to say. People on my channel are going to understand what I'm saying. What happens in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus says, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. There are a couple of different ways you could take this, okay? What most of fundamentalist Christianity has done is they accept the double bind. And a double bind is something like, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, but you can. it only counts if you do it voluntarily without being told. Well, hello, <laughs> that's a double bind. You, I don't know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do unless I also hear the criteria that invalidates my attempt to do it, okay? And so you have all these sex-crazed, perverted, fundamentalist Christians running around who are absolutely fixated on how women dress and what men should do with their eyes and how they should spend their time and what they should and shouldn't look at. And what you wind up doing, there's, what you wind up doing is you wind up foregrounding the idea of illicit consensual or not consensual but um covetous lust you wind up foregrounding that idea in the minds of people so that that's what's always on their mind they're constantly worried about not looking at the wrong billboard not seeing the wrong beer commercial throwing the tv out the house just so they don't see the girls in bikinis and controlling the way all the women dress in church to make sure none of them are running around in booty shorts, as our friend J.D. Martin uh, must secretly have a fetish for. And so now we have this issue where you've created a bunch of, essentially, if you look at the history of church, you find a lot of predation on children, a lot of infidelity, sometimes in some cases to a higher degree than you find it outside the church. And taking that verse, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've created that adultery with her already in her heart. If you take that in such a way to where you are trying to like prevent every opportunity that you have to ever behold a woman that you might, you're going to realize that that is a futile endeavor because any man will tell you, you can, you can look at one woman who is dressed completely immodestly and have absolutely no provocation whatsoever toward any kind of covetous or lustful thought. And, uh, you know, what about doctors? Or you can look at another woman who is following all the rules and dressed professionally and everything else, and you have a passion that burns within you that you just wonder what life would be like with that person, you know? So we've we foregrounded sexuality. We've we basically uh, created generations of a bunch of closet sexual perverts running around who can't control themselves because we've preached a theology which foregrounds uh, their hypothalamic urges and then created an artificial scarcity around it to where those urges um, can't even be entertained in the thought life. Okay, so but a, a different way to look at what Christ is doing is to he's simply reminding people that when you look at a woman to lust after her you've committed adultery with her already in your heart well duh anybody should realize that anybody who hears that is going to realize well i must be an adulterer about you know 4168 times by the time i was 15. um so therefore creating rules around this isn't the answer what are we supposed to do with that information? And I could certainly elaborate on that, but I would also say that people who are oriented toward this kind of legalistic approach, like Lordship Salvation, do not have the answer for that. And they have no idea what Jesus is saying there, probably because if you're not one of Christ's sheep, you can't hear his voice. See, but it almost sounds to me like, like the idea of a potential holiness code is seen itself as legalism yes but i i I think that that is incredibly problematic though immensely so i mean let's just take for example 
the kinds of things that we see in the modern day progressive church and all their leaders like Mason Menyenga and uh, and well, let Kevin me let me Menyenga pause right there and ask you a question. If somebody is truly wise with the wisdom of Christ, do they need to have morals prescribed to them from someone else? Uh, I think often, uh, not always, but you know, it, it certainly depends. If on, they like, do, example, my, I would say that they're not truly wise after the manner of Christ. Well, would you say that somebody, for wisdom, example, wisdom up, transcends the imposition of external morality? Well, first off, let's say I don't, I don't think imposition would be the right word because there are certainly people out there who want to beat people over the head with law, and let, let's just assume they're wrong because I agree with you that they're wrong. Um, but let's say that somebody is, and there's a no, no, uh, number of circumstances where this kind of thing could happen, right? Somebody grows up in, we'll say Afghanistan, right? A lot of the tribal, uh, norms of Afghanistan are things which biblically we would think of as abhorrent, right? Or even just Westernly, if you want to put it that way. But I think the Bible certainly would agree with that, right? Uh, for example, they, there's a lot of customs they have as far as, uh, sexual relations with young boys or as far as tribal uh, grudges being held over generations and generations. Um, the, the stoning of of uh, women who are learning or something like that, right? And so on and so forth. Now, let's say somebody in an Afghani culture comes to Christ by way of a missionary's work, right? And awesome, that person has been redeemed. They're washed by the blood of the lamb. They're saved, right? But their entire life, they're going to have to deal with the fact that they grew up in a culture where those kinds of things are the norm. And they may have even had a, pre a, a precolition toward those kinds of things, right? Um, so it's certainly helpful to have somebody who is either wiser than they are or more learned than they are or more spiritual than they are, or even just coming from an outside culture, period, maybe not quite as wise, but didn't have to deal with the same struggles to say, hey, you know, I know that you think that it's an honorable thing to want to defend your clan, right? But you're holding grudges over things that happened in the 1100s AD. This is not Christ-like, right? And that sort of thing, if spoken in the right spirit, which is non-condemning, but is rather to, to edify, I think every Christian needs that to a certain extent. I would go as far as to say so, even, I mean, that happened to Peter, right? Peter had to be told by Paul, hey, you, you what you're doing here with the circumcision thing is wrong, Right? This, but I don't think Paul was wrong in saying that. I think Paul was just edifying a brother by by bringing him back to the scriptures. We all have to deal with the flesh, right? You would agree with that, right? So if I hear what you're saying and I combine it with one of the things that I see in the chat on your side, um, I'm having a difficult time scrolling up to see that point. Somebody says something like, uh, you know, the Bible tells us we need to have teachers, that kind of thing, almost like I'm advocating the lack of any kind of guidance or leadership. And that is not what I'm doing. I am not stating that every Christian, and this, this is a very good point. I'm glad you brought it up this way so that I can disambiguate what I'm trying to say here. I'm not saying that Christians don't need mentorship and that they don't need guidance and that they can't benefit um, from imposed morality, externally imposed morality early on. As a matter of fact, I very much stress that that should happen. So in what Paul would say, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I thought as a child, I learned as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. When What he would refer to as that, um, some other people would refer to as first half of life wisdom. There is a need for structure, rigidity, rules, and those things need to be in place. And if they are not in place, something happens later on in life to where, you know, a lot of this happens a lot of times in jail when people are 25 years old and they, they find Jesus, right? And any experienced minister who's worth his salt is kind of heavy hearted when they see a prisoner doing that. And really what's happening is it's not so much that they have or haven't found Jesus. It's that they didn't have the proper order, structure, and discipline when they were growing up and they were living like a wild child. And when they say they found Jesus, what they really found is some order, structure, and discipline later in life than they should have got it. 
And because they're getting it later in life and because they are conflating that order, structure, and discipline with Christ, they will likely never mature out of it, okay? So they're never going to be that person who can exercise wisdom. You know, um, in the military, they say, you know, if you're really trained up, you ought to be able to execute properly in the absence of orders, okay? That's what a good soldier could do is figure out the thing that needs to be done with the overall intent and be able to do so without specific orders or an execution plan. And Christians do need a lot of rigid structure early in life, and this should be taught to people, to people in general, okay? But the adherence to those rules throughout one's life with rigid, with, with a high degree of rigidity does not constitute spirituality or growth. It actually indicates otherwise after a certain point. So it's appropriate for first half of life wisdom, but if people grow in wisdom, there should come a time where all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. But that does not mean they're going to be running around using that as an excuse to sin, which some people in the chat seem to think that uh, people could not do otherwise, which is an indication that they are not aware of what the um, of what the wisdom of Christ is. There's actually, well, I, I mean, I I've seen a person in the chat that, right? that I actually look up to. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, and and I, I can see some truth in that as well. I mean, I th here's the thing. I think there's there's kernels of truth in a lot of the things that are being said. But I feel like if they're taken to their logical conclusions a lot of times, and perhaps it's it's an inability to understand, perhaps it's it's not being spoken clearly. I guess I'm not sure because I'm not in a position to really say one way or the other, right? Um, but like, for example, we talk about this idea of like lordship, right? And I think especially, you know, we, we live in the United States of America, probably the most oversexed culture on the planet right now, potentially on the planet ever. Um, so it's necessary for people to say, hey, you know, God doesn't like it when sisters God says not to dress like that. Brothers, God says not to look at them even if they are dressed like that, right? Um, and, and people need to be need these things to be spoken to them by somebody who has a level of authority, obviously in, an, in a non-judgmental fashion. I will agree wholeheartedly that there are plenty of people who use morals as a reason to club everybody over the head. That's not, that's not the way it should be. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more, right? He, the, the teaching of sin no more is wrapped in love for the adulterous woman that's certainly true um but he also does say go and sin no more right so that part of it is true as well and i think when we when we start looking at these issues of like okay where well, there's these lists of do's and don'ts do i expect that a christian who has been walking in the spirit the last 40 years could be in the presence of a of a woman in a bikini or something like that and not ogle her I, su I suspect, yes, I suspect that that man should have enough walk with the spirit, enough self-control not to be perverted in that kind of sense and, and not to fall into the temptation of sin, even if it is right in front of him. At the same time, though, that's not going to be all Christians. It's not even going to be most Christians. And it's still equally true, even with that being the case, that if he does look, it's sinful and her dressing in such a way is sinful, and flip that around too. When guys go out and and dress in their own provocative manner, which is not talked about nearly enough in our culture, that is also sinful. And and women looking at them in such capacity is sinful, right? Like in other words, God has his lists of do's and don'ts for manner of teaching and exhortation, not for manner of condemning. And I think if we put it in its proper category, there we can avoid the legalism that I think if I'm understanding you correctly is, is what you fear in Lordship while also saying, Hey brother, Hey sister, that's not right. And that's something I also think to get to, to speak about the guy with wisdom. You know, I brought up Peter earlier. I think Peter by the fifties AD was probably pretty wise in the spirit, probably much more than we are now. Right. And yet he, even he was susceptible to, what could only be considered a dire sin in so much as that he was not willing to sup with Gentiles and was wanting to, to tell people they needed to be circumcised in order to come into the fold of Christ. Right. And it took another brother wise in the scriptures to say, Hey, don't do that. 
for him to kind of, oh, yeah, I'm not supposed to do that. It's not that he didn't already know, but you need somebody out to remind you, right? And I think, what is it, Hebrews 10.25 that says that we are to be not only not forsaking the gathering to, together of the saints, which is what everybody remembers that verse with, but also exhorting each other unto good works, I think, is how the the um, the end part there uh, is worded. I could be wrong on the exact wording. To there, provoke right? one another to faith, uh, to love and good works. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Right. So it's like there's this both and it's almost like a hypostatic union regarding works. Right. It's not the fact, you know, hypostatic union is, is man and God. Uh, at the, Jesus is man and God at the same time. We almost have a similar hypostatic union in regards to works where it's like, yes, we aren't to be legalistic. We aren't to be bashing people over the head. At the same time, though, God has clearly revealed to us that thing, those things that he doesn't want us to do. And in so much as practicable, we should not only not do those, but should encourage our brothers and sisters around us not to do those. Right. And and I think that could, that's true for the majority of situations. And, and I'll end here because I've been going for a minute. But you brought yeah. up like the example of Saddam Hussein. Um, and, you know, it, it, removing the political aspects of that, because I think from a political standpoint, as bad as Hussein was, uh, what came afterwards was certainly much worse. And maybe we should have counted our blessings at the time that he had order in the country that had not had order for. Oh, have, I, 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 having been over there and having had hundreds of people thank me so much that their kids can go to school and they get to have water and clothes and electricity. I disagree. And, and you know, that, that's, when, a, that, when, and that's they, an when, they, when they see an American flag on the side of someone's shoulder, they feel safe and they come to you with tears and joy, thanking you for being there. And you can't replace that. You can't. You can't pay for that. So, I, I had to throw that in there. Fair enough. Fair. You know, I I, I obviously threw my uh, little opinion in there, so I, I don't mind you throwing yours in as well. Um, but setting that to the side for just a moment, just because that that would probably be a you know a different political conversation. Fruitful, but nevertheless. Um, you know, are, are we really prepared to say that the the women who were committing what can only be described as an egregious sin in the Bible, that that was somehow holy? Or is it more likely that God can use, assuming even that this was all good, that God can use something that is unholy for holy purposes, as he does with Assyria in Isaiah chapter 10, right? He uses Assyria's wicked heart to judge Israel. Now, what they did wasn't good. Them, you know, plundering and raping and murdering and all that kind of stuff. God at no point says Assyria is good, right? Uh, in fact, he in, in Isaiah chapter 10 is quite clear. He's going to judge them for their haughty heart. Um, but he still used it to accomplish his goal, which was to judge the northern kingdom of Israel, right? But are, are we really prepared to say no morality is purely subjective? Actually, what they did in in no, we're in, not saying morality is purely subjective. Well, situational. We'll put it that way. Um, are we prepared to say that morality is situational to such an extent that 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 the paying of uh, these you know prostitutes to go out and, and fornicate and and you know, probably commit adultery because I assume a lot of these guys were married. Um, is that a good thing? I mean, I, it seems to me like that's that's a very problematic view to say that's a good thing. Well, it's it's definitely a paradoxical thing to consider, and those kinds of things are interesting. Um, it's like being in the wisdom gym to consider these things, not for the point of deriving at a conclusion, which the idea that one could do that would be the pursuance of Cartesian philosophy without realizing it, which is funny how people are all against philosophy and then they're just exercising a version of it for which they're not aware of the label. There's a guy in the chat on my side who is, he's ideologically possessed and probably has personality disorder. And he says, living like Christ, he's question, living like Christ is the Lord of our life is wrong, question mark. And he's trying to frame things as if following men's rules and men's dogma is living like Christ, which it's not. And doing so, following men's rules and men's dogma, especially uh, after one should be mature, 1 Corinthians 2, 6, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Um, that is the opposite of living like Christ. You, ma you made a phrase that America is, over, is an over-sexualized society. 
So I want to double click on that just for a second to kind of give you an idea of how what we have here and how what I might call a salience landscape and relevance realization can tie in together to help us understand why we are in the mess that we are in. Uh, Christians are actually participating in a Hegelian dialectic of immoral sexuality without realizing it. They are contributing to the mammon factor with regard to sexuality. We had a few, uh, somebody accused me of calling people fools in the chat. So we had a few fools in Christian history. One of them was named Jerome. One of them was named Augustine. And they both came from a, a pagan background where their their paganism is constantly, you might say, they're um, very sexually promiscuous. And so when they came to the what they called Christianity at the time, they both had like a teetotaling idea of sexuality that completely ruled out any kind of sexuality, and they would even preach against it for all kinds of reasons for everyone else except for the cause of procreation. And to this day, there are a lot of people, Catholics, Baptists, Quakers, uh, you know, who preach that sex of any kind is wrong unless it's for the cause of procreation. So when the pilgrims come over here, the pure, they're called Puritans. Puritans are, um, you know, they're praised by a lot of Calvinists, actually some of the most profane people that ever walked the face of the planet. And the Puritan influence on the American culture resulted in a, an out-of-balance view and practices towards sexuality, which created uh, an enculturated, an artificial scarcity and artificial scarcity is the is the key control via artificial scarcity is the key component of what constitutes mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. So mammon is like uh, imagine a very corrupt capitalistic system that thrives on the control of an artificially scarce environment. And most of the time we see this happen is when a country has plenty of food, but they make it artificially scarce so that they can control the people. Well, if you make what we wind up with is we we wind up with sexual or we wind up with our bodies being sexualized. If you look back at the culture of the New Testament, there was actually social nudity on the regular. People were in the gymnasium. People were in bathhouses. It was a normal thing. We see Paul mentioning these uh, like if you run a race, you're crowned with a crown. All these things are done in the nude in that culture. And these things aren't referenced when he doesn't have. Titus circumcised and he does have Timothy circumcised. Well, how would anybody know? Because when they go to the gym and work out, nobody's got any clothes on. Okay. Everybody knows there's um, things like that, that are in that culture. In our culture, what we think of as godly and holy and everything else, we've been enculturated to have, to be highly susceptible to the artificial scarcity of the human body while also over, while also over sexualizing it. And so on, on one side of the spectrum, you have the, uh, you know, the crazy pornographers and all the, you know, the sex industry, if you will. And on the other side, you have the Christians creating the art of, creating the landscape which makes sexual or makes the body sexualized and artificially scarce on the other side and thus it is a perfect match so that you can charge a high premium for people to have um, hypernormal stimuli with regard to sexual experiences and if you look at other societies there are there are entire tribes uh, for example where everybody is completely naked and the amount of sexual, crime that happens there is nil compared to, especially compared to places like the United States. I lived in Italy for two years and there's literally nudity uh, depicted in statues just about everywhere you go outside. And there's a lot of places where nudity in reality exists just in the culture. Okay. There's, there's women breastfeeding their kids is the norm. If you go to the beach, there's a lot of people not wearing any clothes. And I know all the legalists out there say you shouldn't be at the beach, that kind of thing. And I, um, but that's beside the point. The point is, is that that entire society, it's, it's normal. The body is not over sexualized and there is not as much sexual crime and there aren't as many sexual perverts running around, 
uh, molesting people and uh, harassing people, doing all that kind of thing. Christians are actually participating in a Hegelian dialectic of art- making sexuality artificially scarce, so that it, so that in so that it can be commodified, and people can charge a high a high premium for it. And what what Christians don't realize is that we as a group are playing our role in that. And uh, we don't have a lot of systems thinkers these days. We have a lot of legalistic thinkers who who don't think. They don't think about what's going on. And it's um, kind of risky to say some of the things that I'm saying and to think about some of these things. But we need to think about some of these things. Well, some of it, to be honest, if I could just be very blunt, I, I kind of just flatly disagree with. Like, so you brought up Italy. Um, and to a certain extent, you know, I, there was debate in the Renaissance um, there's a famous quote. Somebody asked Michelangelo, why do you draw people in the nude? And he says, because I want to see them as God sees. And then the guy says, well, you're not God. And it's a relatively famous conversation from the time. Um, of course, what's left out of the conversation is the fact that Michelangelo was a homosexual. Now, I'm not saying that condemns him necessarily. He it's, he seems to have believed in God. And, and I think God can also save people from that particular sin as well. Uh, you can save it people from any sin, right? So I'm not I'm not condemning Michelangelo here, but it's also like, you know, him and, and Donatello is another example, right? Raphael, is, in fact, Raphael, there's an old legend, whether or not it's true is debated, but there's an old legend that he died from exhaustion, having had too much sex with too many partners in too short a period of time, right? So when we say, well, they have all this art in the nude, it's like, well, yeah, but a lot of those guys were, whether it was struggling or outright endorsing, immensely perverted. And even if we look at modern Italy today, right, modern Italy has, like, for example, this political party. I don't know exactly what the word is, but the translation of it is the love party. But I, I think it's like a more or something like that, but I don't, I don't speak Italian. Uh, and it was a, a political party, an actual political movement of, of, uh, porn stars and homosexuals that got together to form this political party in an attempt to basically try to make sex more commercialized, have their open orgy houses and stuff like that, which not only did they succeed in doing that, but they even had a, a, uh, a woman, I can't remember her name, but she was a porn star elected to like a high ministry office back in the late nineties, early two thousands, which even America has not gotten to that point yet. We've had, uh, pornographers run for office. Larry Flint famously ran for governor of California in 2003. It was one of like 12 celebrities to do so. Of course, Schwarzenegger won. Um, but nobody took him seriously. So in some instances, Italy is actually much worse than we are, despite the, and you can almost even say because of, it seems, their incredibly liberal views of human sexuality. Now, is there exceptions to that? Well, certainly. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of times there's this big debate about uh, breastfeeding in public. It's a dumb debate. And I'm sure you might even agree with that. It's a it's a very stupid debate that doesn't get us anywhere, because clearly the woman who's even if it, let's just say hypothetically for sake of argument that it is inappropriate. The woman is not trying to be inappropriate. She's trying to feed her child. Right. So we can certainly agree that there's there's a level of ridiculousness in that. Right. But when we have people who are walking around, like I work in a restaurant <clears throat> virtually every day, there are people, cause we have an open bar and it's got, you know, somewhat of a, of a, a high class atmosphere. And so you'll have, you know, young women in their twenties coming in wearing what essentially amounts to bras and booty shorts, right? That is not only is it showing a lot of skin, but the clothing is specifically designed to accentuate the sexual nature of the skin. It's not just that you're showing it. You could even argue that a naked person might be less sexualized than somebody wearing those particular articles of clothing because a naked person has nothing actually propping up, the, you know, pushing up the breasts, for example, or, or bedazzling the, the pockets, therefore drawing the eye to, to one's butt or something like that. You know what I mean? So like, and I bring these things up not to disregard what you'd said earlier, because I, as a Christian man, should be strong enough in my walk in the spirit that that's not something that is necessarily concerning to me. Right. I don't have to go out and be lusting after these women just because they happen to be around. At the same time, though, these things are not they're not 
blasé about sexual sexuality. They're specifically evoking provocative feelings. And the same thing I think is true in, in Italy. You know, there's the famous idea of the French hooker, right? So France is one that we could say similarly. I think Britain, for the most part, tends to be relatively uh, modest, and I don't think they have quite the same. Of course, the Puritans came from Britain, so that, I mean, even that I'm going to have to take back. The point here kind of being, you know, is, is there situations in which the lack of nudity cannot be, uh, or excuse me, where, where nudity can be non-sexual? I don't think there's very many people in African tribes that are normally topless who think of breasts as sexual, right? So certainly there's some cultural back and forth to go there, although I even wonder about that because it does seem well, like... That, what, that would get into the issue of appropriateness. There was a missionary who went out to a tribe in Africa, for example, and all the women were topless and only the prostitute women wore shirts. You see, so there's a appropriateness has something to do with situational context. Well, and I think that's true. I, I won't even deny that, right? Because there's there's some truth to that. There is certainly some, in fact, I can just give a plain example. You brought up earlier how some groups say uh, sex for any reason that is not procreative is sinful. Um and I'll, I'll be very blunt. I mean, if you if a husband and wife have a stripper pole in their bedroom for her to use for his pleasure, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, you know, I don't think the Bible is anti-sexual pleasure within the confines of a holy matrimony. Um, but, you know, obviously doing that for, for pay in the middle of downtown New York is a completely different context, right? Um and I think that, and I'll, my last point here, you, you know, you had brought up the, the gymnasiums, right? The word gymnas actually means naked. And, and you're exactly right. It was all done in the nude. One of the big reasons that the Maccabees were so infuriated that, uh, uh, you know, in the 160s, 170s BC is, uh, is the fact that they built a, a gymnasium, gymnasium, in uh, the, uh, the old city of Jerusalem. And it was very near to where the temple actually was, right? <clears throat> and they were they were disgusted with this. How could you have these people doing all their workouts and stuff here in the nude? And we can say, okay, but in that culture, that wasn't necessarily sexual. And it's like, but is that true? Because in that culture, they were also, uh, pederasty was just normal. It's just a thing people did. Uh, adultery was so rampant that Augustus Caesar had to pass a law saying, don't do that. Uh, or, or there's going to be serious consequences, right? Um, prostitution was not only common, but you'd have temple prostitutes who worshipped at the altar of, say, like Aphrodite, the goddess of sex and love, right? And, and one of the ways they do this kind of thing is by being sexual, right? And, and so we can, like, we can say that it wasn't in a sexual context, but yet we're also talking about cultures that were immensely, whether it's Italy, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, modern France, so on and so forth, were immensely perverted. And there are some contexts where I can agree with that, like you said, with the tribe in Africa. But I think a lot of times the rule tends to be pretty much the same. People who are constantly naked are typically constantly naked because the culture itself is in some sense sexually debased. Just like a Spartan culture that's constantly violent is probably constantly violent because they're debased in that manner. They'd go out and kill slaves regularly. They uh, expose kids, which is where you just kind of leave them out and, and let them die by the end. So you know, let's, I'm, let's try to let's try to dig a different direction here because I think that the anecdotal evidence without scientific data is going to be pointless to make these cases. We can use a different issue, for example. Um, statistically, <laughs> statistically, uh, okay, living in Italy. They are, there is alcohol everywhere and, but there are no drunks. Now I say that, uh, without distinction, not without exception, which I'm sure you understand. Right. In the United States, alcohol is much more highly regulated. And like in Italy, there's nothing wrong. There's like, everyone gives wine to their kids for dinner. You know, that kind of thing goes on all the time. And there's laws against that kind of thing in many of the States. Um, so 
the idea that so there's a the concept of hypernormal stimuli is a big deal here too as well and with norms and so if you have something that is you like over here in the states there's lots of christians who who are teetotalers every kind of alcohol is bad but then you have an entire country where alcohol consumption does not cause the problems that it causes over here and and so i mean we could we could delve into each one of these issues but the overall point is that if you are wise, you're not going to be pursuing hypernormal stimuli either sexually or uh, with drugs or alcohol or with anything else. You're not going to be doing something. So what, what would really constitute wisdom would be an ability to aim for the right goal and do actions which are appropriate and getting you closer to that goal with every action. And it is impossible to pre-specify what those actions must or must not be. Now, Paul sees this, and he's trying to hint toward it. He's trying to lean toward it. He's trying to specify it. You know, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. So the point is, you know, if we're talking about lordship salvation, Ultimately, the concept of perseverance of the saints is a backdoor to believing you can lose your salvation. Practically, it's exactly the same. Because the person, they, they feel compelled, they are made to feel compelled to follow a list of rules generated by some church institution, or they get pronounced as either never having been saved or as having lost their salvation. Either way, the person goes from thinking they're saved to now thinking they're lost because some man-made institutional dogma has put a list of controls over who gets to be in the in-group and not. So the whole exercise is an exercise in profanity. We definitely need rigidity and structure during the first half of life. Uh, but by the time someone is hitting around age 30, maybe they should uh, be able to pick their own bedtime. Yeah, and, and the, I, I certainly have a lot of agreement with that. I mean, even now, I'm, I'm only 25. I haven't been drunk since I was 19, but I enjoy be beer quite nine. frequently. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but <laughs> that was a good one. Um, but, you know, like, like I... I I have beer rather frequently because I know that, you know, to, to have a glass of beer, I mean, you don't even get a strong buzz from it. You know what I mean? It's, it's just a drink at the same way that coffee is uh, the same way that, that, you know, the same buzz quote unquote, you might get from having too much Sprite. Um, so keeping that out of its you know context of alcoholism is certainly so you tell not me you're more. never saved. Well, there might be some people who have said that certainly I, I, I you know, I would, no, you're good. I, I, cause I, I understand the, you know, the humor. In I came it, from an independent Baptist line. background that was absolutely teetotally on alcohol. I never, I never. So the first time I ever tasted alcohol was, uh, I was in Iraq. I was deployed the second time I was deployed and I was at the, the Protestant, the generic Protestant church service. And they were having communion. So I'm like, it's the closest thing there is to any kind of church service. So I'm participating. And there were two lines for communion. I did not I did not realize that the two lines, one was alcoholic and one was not alcoholic. And so when I tasted this, I thought I was drinking medicine or something. I'm like, you know, what is this? And then someone told me, oh, you got in the alcoholic side. And I, I felt like, I felt... Uh, I felt violated. I was mad. I'm like, they didn't tell me. I had this like agreement with myself and God that I would never touch alcohol. And here I was having it slipped in on me at church of all places. When you think your peers would do that at school or at the bar or at work or something else. Nope. Church, church got me, <laughs> you know? And so my conscious mind at the time, uh, yeah, uh, uh, 27 years old, never tasted alcohol. Well, and there is even so to an hear you say, yeah, I have a beer every now and then. I mean, you know, I'm 44 right now. I don't care. I don't, I don't give a cheetah flip, but there was a time when that would equate 
to me, that would equate to you not being right with God at best, but most likely not even being saved. Because that was the lordship salvation criteria associated with the in-group that I was in. Yeah, and I can and I can certainly understand how, you know, there's actually, there's a sermon that um, I've referenced a few times on this channel. R.C. Sproul has the sermon called uh, Tyranny of the Weaker Brethren, where he essentially says, um, you know, there is, you know, we, we are supposed to be obviously aware of the weaker brother. Like, you know, he talks about like, if, if I have a brother who finds it wrong to eat meat, then I won't eat meat. Uh, and of course, there's the famous joke that a lot of Christians use. Oh, you know, Paul called the vegetarian the weaker brother. And it's kind of funny, but nevertheless, you know, the point there just kind of being, you know, Paul saying, all right, if that's the case, I won't do that for sake of him. Right. Um, and R.C. Sproul talks about how, you know, that that's true. You should do that, of course, because that's in the scripture. At the same time, though, when you have the weaker brethren now lording over you, oh, you eat meat, you're evil, you're sinful. You drink beer, you're evil, you're sinful, stuff like that. It's like, well, no, certainly there's ways you can do that, which are sinful. I'm sure, you know, we could probably agree that gluttony is not good or that going out and and maliciously treating animals. Let's, is let's good. can we pause there just for a second? Yeah, certainly. We're, so when we're talking, Lordship Salvation seems to be, as we've been discussing it so far, seem we have tended to elevate all the things that one is not supposed to do. What's what are we supposed to be doing? What are we supposed to be aiming for? My here so let me lay it out for the the proper Christian life would be to pursue Christ in such a way that in the pursuance of Christ the the weight and the sins which does do so easily beset us get laid aside because you realize what a problem that they're causing you. You know, I'm I'm a, I'm somewhat of an athlete. I play volleyball. I like to lift weights, things like that. And when I notice that I'm trying to achieve certain goals and there are certain things in my life that are help are are hindering me from getting there, I set those things aside. Not because those things are should be banned for everyone for all time because you're not really saved if you do them, but because the, the goal that I'm trying to hit, this does not align with that. And I think the entire conversation of what we should and should not be doing should be framed in terms of what is appropriate for us to maximize positively in light of what we should be aiming at. And I think that's a scary question for a lot of people because they have no idea what to aim at or what it looks like. And therefore, they have nothing by which they can calibrate their their wisdom, so to speak, to make choice their discernment to make choices to reach that goal because they have nothing to aim at. So, in in absence of something to aim at, what I can do is I can normalize to a legalistic in group that has a bunch of dogma and doctrines, and I can learn to propagate and defend these with high fidelity, so I can. Uh, move up the hierarchy and centralize to the to the in group, and I can learn to keep all the rules, so I can virtue signal to all of them that I'm one of the good guys and I'm holy and I'm spiritual. So people aim for that instead of aiming for transformation to become more like Christ, and in so doing, they aim for that. So they're they're focused on all these things that they should not be doing. Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind. Looking forward to those things which are, are ahead, I press toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what Christians should be doing. And we have no, by and large, have no idea what we should be pressing forward to. So we get focused on all the things people should be repenting from. It's because they're aimless. They have no aim. They're wanton. Yeah, and if somebody, I think, is being moralistic, that can certainly be a concern. But I don't think everybody who says refrain from such and such is being moralistic. And to, I could use actually well, the same analogy you gave, right? I would I would say when that word moralistic is very interesting because I think that it extends into much of the more academic side of the theological debates. I mean, it, ultimately, Calvinists are going to present the idea of sovereignty as if you are either inept or immoral if you don't agree with them on that concept the way they've presented it. So 
moralism creeps into all the ways that we virtue signal in the theological landscape, not just the do's and don'ts of behavior. So uh, I'll, I want to set that aside for only a moment because I think it sounds like I actually even changed the title of this video because we're, we've pretty much, which lordship is of course integral to Calvinism. So there's no issue. Uh, but Issues like sovereignty, determinism, stuff like that, we didn't really address much. So um, if you'd like to, to come back on another time and we can discuss those as well, I'd be certainly game. But I think for this this conversation might center uh, just the way it ended up working out around the Lord. Well, the practice. concept of when you say moralism, that's actually an issue we talk about a lot on our channel is um, what hap we, we act like um, Calvinists and non-Calvinists will have debates and we're debating data and conclusions as if they are epistemically arrived at but all sides of these kinds of debates tend to moralize we bring in what we call non-epistemic ranking criteria which is a way of framing things morally to make people have a positive or negative affinity toward a particular concept without actually epistemically supporting it in other words so for example they might present the concept of election in terms of pride or humility or thankfulness and God being in control rather than produce any epistemic merit for why they think that's correct. And because Christians know they're supposed to be humble and they're not supposed to be prideful and that it's sanctimonious to believe that God's in control, those kinds of things can sway people toward an argument that has no epistemic merit. And this is extremely sly. The moralistic framing in theological arguments is extremely sly, and most people don't catch it. So it's very important to keep an eye out on, on the moralism, in my opinion, and, and to become very sensitive to it and to work on not doing it. Yeah, and I can even agree with some of that, right? But I, I also think, so you, you, know, you brought up the guy working out, right? Now, let's say I'm actually... I, I started working out around October, so I can even just use myself as an example, right? I'd always been just the, the skinny shrimp um, who would rather eat hot Cheetos than, than be fit, right? Um, so when I started... That's a great example right there. Like not eating hot Cheetos doesn't make you fit. So you could throw all the Cheetos away and you won't get fit. It's, right, but... You see what I'm saying? There has to be something you're working through, supposed to, aiming for and doing something towards something, not just avoiding right. something. But, but that actually that fits perfectly with what I was about to say, right? So when I started around, it was actually Halloween day of last year that I started, which is the only reason I can remember the exact day because it happened to be holiday. Um, there was a conscious decision of I have to refrain from certain things I'm doing. I eat too much sugar. I eat too much uh, you know, salt and stuff like that. And also I have to start doing other things. I need to actually work out drink a healthy amount of water, uh, get good sleep, stuff like that, right? And there's no con uh, contrast between the two. There's no contradiction between the two. Now, if I do one without the other, I won't actually be getting healthy as I'd like to, right? If I work out, but I still eat like garbage, well, internally, I'm still going to suffer. And if I eat, uh, eat well, but don't actually do anything that's active or drink good water or anything like that, right? Or even just say cease from eating poorly. Because I think there's a middle ground where you're you're not eating potato chips and, and chips ahoy every day, but you're also not getting your proper proteins and fibers and stuff like that, right? That's also not going to get me to my goal either. Rather, it's a combination of both meeting together, right? I'm not eating a constant, you know, a, a ridiculous amount of you know sleeves of Oreos every day, um, which is almost not even an exaggeration to be honest. <laughs> and I'm also you know, replacing that with make sure I'm drinking a proper amount of water, make sure I'm eating good, healthy, natural proteins and fibers and vitamins, work out, that kind of stuff, right? And, and they both meet together to form what is now my goal. And as a result, over the last, you know, six months, I guess it'd be closer to eight months now, um, I've put on, you know, because my problem was being shrimpy and skinny, right? 143 pounds. I'm roughly 180 at the moment. And it's all been that healthy muscle weight, blood pressure has gone down, sleep's improved, all those kinds of things, right? Um, now, that's a real world example of me. 
where I, I did both at the same time and that brought me to my goal. And I did both at the same time because of that intended goal, right? Now to take that analogy and, and bring it to the theological landscape, I have things I want to refrain from in being uh, uh, conformed to the image of Christ, right? Like I don't want to be a drunk and I don't want to be a lustful person and I don't want to be, you know, calling my brother fool and stuff like that. And at the same time, I also have things I do want to be doing, being in the word, being in the spirit, reading my scriptures, going to church, giving to charity, right? Um, trying to have a relationship with God. Of course, the, the main thing, the sure thing being the foundation of, by grace are you saved through faith. So all of these things, even they're more to the sanctification aspect. They're not so much to the salvation aspect, because I, I think that, you know, we, we do need to be clear. Good works and refraining from bad works are things that I think people do as a result of salvation, not be, to be saved. You're saved by grace through faith, period. But nevertheless, you, you see what I mean? It's like these things, they work in tandem with each other. It's not one against the other. My being uh, married and eventually having children and those kinds of things works in tandem with my refraining from pornography, right? Like they, 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 it's both at the same time. My uh, uh, being, you know, not being violent, which is something that, you know, I, I grew up in a pretty ghetto area. I was a relatively violent kid. My not being violent works in tandem with my loving my brother as I love myself. One's active, one's negative, but both are working together to form a CJ who is working more and more towards being conformed to the image of Christ. You see what I mean? Okay. Um, and, and so I, I think that you, my, my point there is just to say, I, I think that if there are people who are framing stuff in a moralistic uh, manner, we should... You know, we should correct them, certainly. Um, I think often it's uh, a fellow brother in Christ, but maybe not always. But nevertheless, we should correct them as at least a brother in Adam, right? But I don't think everybody who's saying don't do or do is a moralist. I think that a lot of times, though, they're just, you know, people who are trying to edify. And, you know, keep in mind with some of the guys even that we think of as moralists, like John MacArthur. I mean, John MacArthur's Lordship Salvation books were written in a very specific context where people, and I've been arguing with these people recently, were saying essentially, um, you know, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. You know what I mean? That's obviously me taking from the scripture to say that, but like, I don't know if you've heard like uh, Bob Wilkin, for example. He, he, he claims that to believe in Christ is the same thing as, it's, it's equivalent to the same way you believe George Washington was the first president. In other words, if you just think that Christ is who he says he is, that's all. And there's no repentance necessary. There's no walk afterwards that happens. Sanctification is completely optional, right? That's the context in which John MacArthur started writing what he wrote. It wasn't just him wanting to get up and say, all you guys are so bad and evil and terrible, and you need to buy my book to make yourself better, right? It was like, there's a problem in this church where we think we can just say, oh, I'm a Christian, so it doesn't matter that I'm in a polyamorous relationship. So it doesn't matter that, and lest anybody think I just made that example up, Brendan Robertson, who's a progressive theologian, has quite literally said, your polyamorous relationships are holy before God. Your homosexual relationships are holy before God, all these kinds of things. Things that are just detestable, right? Like to, to tell people that that living in sin is holy, it's that's not good, Right. So I, I think, I, I guess my whole entire point in this, this little mini rant here is to say, saying you ought not or you ought is not in and of itself being legalistic. Legalistic people do that, but it's not that that in and of itself isn't legalism. It can very often be good, godly, biblical Christian edification. You know what I mean? So I would ask the question, how would you interact with yourself? So with regard to addressing other people, there are, there are a lot of premises that we have. And actually, I'm going to do a video. I'm working on a video right now on, uh, you know, it's Pride Month. What, what should be our disposition as Christians toward 
these kinds of things in society. Right. And a lot of the way we think is based on the premise of being embedded in an in-group that is normalized by affirmation of propositional conclusions. And you can you can affirm the right conclusions and virtue signal enough to get accepted into just about any evangelical church without actually demonstrating any procedural, perspectival, or participatory capacity to be more like Christ or to increase qualitatively in your capacity to be more like Christ or to recursively um, create a more Christ-like future version of yourself? And what does that look like if you did? So our in-groups are normalized by affirmations of certain things. They are not in, so if you were to go to a different kind of group, for example, they like in evangelicals in the West, we ask each other, what are your beliefs? In the East, they don't care what your beliefs are, and I don't think Jesus would have either, being from the East. He, they would ask something like, what do you do? What's your practice? If you were to meet, um, if you were to meet, let's say, okay, you mentioned weightlifting. If you, mentioned, if you met an expert weightlifter, would you ask him what his beliefs are? Or would you ask him what he does? If you were interested in basketball and you had a chance to, you know, talk to, uh, you know, Kevin Durant or LeBron James or somebody, would you would you ask them what their beliefs are or would you ask them what they do? They have become exceptionally good at doing something, right? So you really wouldn't care. Do, do they have opinions about the kind of wood that's used for the basketball court or what kind of rim is best or what the what kind of leather is used for the basketball? You really wouldn't care about their beliefs about those things. You would be curious about what they're doing because they have very obviously excelled to the top of their game and the ability to play it well. And so that's the kind of question you're going to ask. And if you were to ask the question, um, the people who are on the radio preaching evangelical Christianity, um, from my estimation, they're all doing so at in a way and from a perspective that I think Paul would call carnal in the sense of 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3. Uh, that we Christianity is not producing any elders these days. We're not producing any wise elders. There are no Christians we can run up to and say, wow, how did you learn to do what you're doing? Why? Because no Christians are doing anything worth doing. The only thing we can do somewhat is persuade other people to become like captive to the same ideological possession that has us captive. And the more people we can persuade to that, the more good we think we are doing. But how come the agentic people, people like Elon Musk, people like Steve Jobs, you know, you could argue that Steve Jobs has changed the world um, just based on the conversation that we're having right now. We owe it to Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. People like that are extremely agentic and they have changed the world. Why aren't Christians producing these people? Why aren't institutional evangelical churches producing people who are agentic, who can actually make a difference in the world, who can change people from being worse than they are to being better than they are. Well, instead of wise elders, why are we producing leaders who are, are in, like honing in on rivalry and who are taking 16-year-old girls across the state lines to molest them before they turn them back over to their parents? Why are we producing that instead of wise elders? We're not producing wise elders, but there needs to be a um, not just what do you believe. So to have the question of and point that I'm getting at or the, the thing that I want to get around to because I made a few points on along the way is that when we interact with an individual, we tend to think of how they fit in, the, in a notch in an affirmationally normalized in-group rather than what is mine to do with respect to them to help reality unfold itself to them in such a way that they can see clearly the next rung on their ladder of transformation? 
And we may not always know what that is. So for example, say you have a polyamorous person. Say you have someone who's of a particular disposition or activity that you highly disagree with. Going straight for that thing may not be the first thing that they need to hear in order to get where they need to be. There may need to be a few steps in between and a wise person can help see that and also a wise person would not presume to pre-prescribe where they want them to be because along the way you could find out that that person who we're going to condemn for how they're living might also have some signal, some message to give to us about reality that we weren't saying before. And so there's a degree of curiosity that also needs to be there. What message that I'm not getting is trying to speak through this? And then can we work together so that we can both make each other better in an open-ended, a good faith way without committing sophistry and being judgmental? How do we do that? How do we, how do we interact with people so that they can actually transform that li- next little micro step that they need? Because what's going to happen if you have a polyamorous person in your church? Two things are going to happen. You're going to kick them out of your church and then they can't come back anymore because they're not complying. And then they're going to go somewhere else and not transform. Or you're going to state the requirement that we don't allow polyamory. So they're going to stop their polyamory on the outside. They're going to virtue signal that they're not polyamorous. And on the inside, they're really still going to be. And then they're going to grow resentful and hate you and the in-group and themselves. And they're going to later on destroy their lives because we jump the gun in a way that lacks wisdom. So how do we interact with such people in a way to where neither one of those two things happen? And I think the way this church is structured, we don't have a space where we can properly do that because we have strayed so far from what Christ started when he started his church. Yeah, and I think, and we'll get close to the to the wind down here because we're about to hit two hours. I was just so, getting started. Uh, I'll say this, and, and you can also, you know, respond here because I do want to give you, uh, as my guest, last uh, last word on that. I also want to read some of these super chats. I guess we only have three, and two of them are stickers, so I only got to read one. Um, but you know, I, I'm a, I'm sure you know Doug Wilson. Um, he has a, uh, you know, a a how would you say this? policy, I guess. I don't know. I feel like that's the wrong word of, you know, he's talked about how there are repentant uh, homosexuals in his church and and even one individual who's been uh, convicted of pedophilia. Um, And he's described them before as uh, Christians who struggle with, you know, this particular sin, whatever happens to be there. And, you know, he's, his message to people has been, you know, we, we don't want to condemn the person because of the sin that they struggle with, because otherwise they can't come out of that sin into something that is better, right? At the same time, we can't tell them we accept that, so we need to tell them, hey, God in his, in his word has said homosexuality is wrong, uh, or in the case of, of the pedophile, you know, don't. Uh, the Ezekiel 16 and, and 1 Corinthians 7, you know, there's an age for love. It's after the breasts have formed. It's after you've grown up, all that kind of stuff. Or in the case of 1 Corinthians 7, it talks about after the flowering of her Can age. I double click on one of the phrases that you used? Sure. So this is actually a really good point that needs to be made. You said because God said that it was wrong. Sorry, I was looking to throw my snot rag away. And my trash cans across the room. So cool. if... When, when God says that something's wrong, that, you know, I don't know if you studied anything about Jonathan Haidt moral foundation. That's, that's a moral reason to say things it's called a divine ethic or, a, or a sanctity degradation ethic, where we're creating some kind of degradation against an, an entity, which we ultimately cannot evidentially prove to somebody based on the criteria that they specify they're an atheist or something else. So what I advocate for people to do is to think about why God would say something is wrong. Like 
imagine, and I, and I don't mean this in a very like a hubristic way, a egotistical, conceited way, but imagine for a second that you're God and you're giving the rules for what should and shouldn't be done. What's the wisdom behind saying that's wrong? Okay. Figure that out. And then when you talk to people about it, talk about that wisdom rather than just reference that God said it wrong. Because if invoking a moralism from a being whose mere existence or conceptualization is highly debatable um, in our society is not going to make a lot of traction. Whereas if you can embody and encapsulate the wisdom behind why God would say such a thing to, in the first place and then operate linguistically from that perspective, we might actually make some more headway. Yeah, that's not actually a bad point. And I'll say, in my, so in my personal evangelism, which so far has been limited to uh, people I, I actually know directly, I haven't gone out and like street preach or anything like that. But, um, you know, very often that kind of thing will come up. So like, for example, I have uh, witnessed to, uh, you know, a couple of, of young women and eventually the conversation does come up. Okay, well, why is such and such a a clothing pattern wrong? Why does God say that, that we want to dress modestly? And you explain to them, well, actually, there, you know, there is an underlying principle. It's not just simply God said because he's capricious and arbitrary, right? It's, uh, you know, we don't want to entice people to sin. You want to value yourself more than just something that's objectified. God is a being of love. And this is a way in which you love him by using his creation, which is all of us. We're all his creation in the way in which it's intended, as well as loving others by not wanting to entice to sin and stuff like that. And so on and so forth. I'm being very vague here, of course, because this is a multi-hour conversation. But yeah, explain the underlying you reason. The Bible says to dress modestly. I'm like, bam, stop. Why do you think it says that? And what? why do you think it's defined the way that you think it's defined? You know what I'm saying? There's so many premises built into what you're saying that need to be clarified in order to speak at a high level of resolution. Yeah, and, and my point here is to say that when those conversations come up, you know, those are the kinds of things that I do attempt to clarify and we all should attempt to clarify, right? We should be, We should make sure people know if God said this, how do we know? And if God said this, why, if we can deduce such a thing, because I don't think God necessarily owes us an explanation, but if we can. Right, why but the do fact that he doesn't owe us an explanation is not, that's a moralistic, that's a, that's a moralistic statement that is not going to be accepted by somebody else. So you'd have to, if you're going to stop there axiomatically, you'd have to come presuppositionally, which has very limited transformational capacity. So we're going to have to derive the wisdom for why God says what he did at the time when he said it to the people where he said it, and then determine how that then applies to us and how we should behave to people. So if I'm talking to, say, a group of Catholics, I need to understand what our shared vocabulary is. And we at least agree that there's a God and that maybe scripture is true. So I could speak about God in pretty generic terms, probably for a lot of purposes. But if I'm trying to broaden the scope and talk to people who don't share my presuppositions about God, I'm going to have to appeal to them on the basis of things that we share. Like Paul goes all the way back in Acts 17, all the way back to creation, rather than to the shared presuppositions that he and the Jews already share. Uh, and so what is that? What is that thing we need to go back to if we're trying to relate to people in a way that they're going to find meaningful and helpful? And appealing to God generically is not going to be relevant in a lot of cases. And I know I'm going to get a lot of things like the word of God will never return void. I, I know. I know all the things. I know all the things. Yeah, and I don't. The thing is, I don't necessarily disagree with that. But what I'm saying is, when these things come up with the non-believer, uh, the inquisitive enough non-believer who wants to have this conversation, of course, because if somebody's just not willing to listen, I don't think it helps at all to press them. Um, you know, the, those 
the reasons behind those things, I think we should clearly articulate. So if I'm going to make the claim to a young woman who wants to come with, um, with, uh, who, who wants to come with a question, you know, why do you say I should dress in a sexually modest manner? You say God says, but what's the underlying logic behind that? Why do you think God says that? I think it's, it's entirely appropriate for me to say, okay, so let me explain from a natural perspective, from a psychological perspective, from a philosophical perspective, from a spiritual perspective, whatever position is going to best edify that individual, why I think that's there. First, of course, some people would make the argument, well, is it there? So you got to prove to them that it is there. And then if they want to know why, then explain why. Explain why that kind of thing makes sense, right? Or, or, or why it's the kind of... And, Really, I think it can boil down in most cases. Now, there's a lot of conversation that has to happen around this. But the foundation, the tree trunk, if you will, that holds up all the branches is uh, the the law or the do's and don'ts, if you will, is a reflection of God's character. And God is love. So the reflection of God's character ultimately boils down to best loving God and best loving his creation, uh, whether that be other individuals or even, you know, things like, like animals and stuff like that. Right. Um, but of course, how we get there, people do want to know. And so, you know, that to, to reference dial back that conversation, um, with these people. And again, this is, you know, they're multi-hour conversations. It does, it's not just straight to, okay, well, this is what I think. So therefore you should concede, but it is one of those things where, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's see first off, is my interpretation of what is said in First Timothy true, right? Secondly, um, why does the Bible say that if it is true? Once we've gotten past that point, why has he said that? You know, what are the other things he says in Scripture that inform that? What are the things outside of Scripture in our in our day to day life that we both agree with that can inform us as to why those kinds of things would be said? Do they relate back to God's own character, which is a reflection of love and holiness, right? And those are important conversations to have, certainly. Um, I don't think, once again, though, I think that that kind of is similar to the, 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 the this is what you should do and this is what you don't do thing, right? It works in tandem. If I say to somebody, you shouldn't be uh, polyamorous, for example, right? Um, that works in tandem with the explanation why is lack of polyamory what God said, right? It's not that there's one or the other. It's that they work together to form the, the, the true, you know, I think revealed truth of God. God gave the command. There is an underlying reason why God gave the command. And the underlying reason and the command themselves come together for our own edification and understanding. So we know, oh, okay, I can see clearly why God says the things that he does. And I think for most things, that's true. Like I said, I, I, I don't believe God necessarily owes us anything. And so if something is not necessarily clear there for the believer, we accept it anyway. But nevertheless, for the non-believer, of course, we could see how that maybe, maybe doesn't suffice. Maybe we're seeking clarity about the wrong thing. That could be true. I, I, you know, I won't necessarily disagree with that in all circumstances. Um. But suffice it to say, I, I think that the I think these things have to be understood as being two halves of the same coin, not a new coin over and against the other. No. So if if I'm dealing with anybody, um there is a uh if I'm dealing with somebody who's polyamorous, do we really think that they've never heard a religious zealot tell them that they think that it's wrong? Do we really think they've never heard that? Do they really? Do we really think that they've never heard someone try to make a biblical case for why it's wrong, especially if they find themselves in a in a you know religious setting? They probably obviously heard this. Okay, so there's something else going on there. And there's a lot of things about with regard to that particular thing that we don't understand. We don't under, There's a lot of things about uh, the normal range of sexual plasticity that we don't understand. There's a lot of things about causality and divergence of people's 
uh, different proclivities and desires that we don't understand. And so with all the things that we don't understand, it's important that we work with people in a way that cradles them and protects them from any ideology that we might impose on them and cause them to interact with reality in such a way that reality unfolds to them in a way that presents to them something desirable that attracts them to be one micro step better than they are now, which is the same thing you're going to do with anybody without respect to whatever hang up that they're doing, whether it's obvious or not. And that's, that's the way to interact with people. It's to interact with them in wisdom to help them apprehend the flow of reality in such a way that they see something that is worth striving to do better than what they're doing now. And then they grasp for that. And for us to pre-specify what that is, is an act in profanity ultimately. And I'm not trying to say that we don't make clear statements about things that God did or didn't say. We can make that kind of stuff clear statement all the time. But the way that we're dealing with people, we're not dealing effectively with them. We're dealing ineffectively with them. We're not dealing with them in a way that creates lasting, genuine, qualitative change for the better. We're dealing with them in a way that creates inauthenticity, lack of genuineness, virtue signaling, and a hard shell of virtue signaling legalism from which they will never crack out of and then they will never transform. And it's a huge problem. And, and I do think sometimes that's true. <clears throat> I guess my biggest objection is I just don't think it's always true. I, and I think with a lot of these guys who who I, I suspect you might think it's true of, specifically your Lordship Calvinist guys, your Doug Wilsons, MacArthur's, James White's, et cetera. Um, I think that I think I would I see that as an as a misinterpretation of the stuff that they specifically are saying. <clears throat> um Although I'm sure there's examples of, of plenty of people, you know, I think everybody's sinful. So there's examples of everybody in every camp or even a lack of camps, which I guess in and of itself is its own camp. Um, you know, doing things that are, are not just or doing things in an improper way or doing things that are moralistic or, or what have you. Um, but nevertheless, I, I do want to say, so we've hit the, the two hour mark here. So I want to go ahead and start to, to shut this down a little bit. Um, but I want to give you some time to sort of recap your thoughts on this conversation and, and, and give some, some parting thoughts as well. I appreciate having you on here, by the way. And uh, if you are at all interested, because we stuck pretty much the whole two hours to the Lordship issue. Um, if you are ever interested in, in discussing some other issues pertaining to Calvinism, like, you know, uh, uh, exhaustive divine determinism or God's ordinance of evil or any of the other, you know, I mean, insert Calvinistic topics here. Um, I'm certainly uh, totally game to have you back on. I appreciated this conversation very much. Um, actually, hang on. One thing I wanted to ask you before I do, Eric Peterson was kind enough to give us a super chat here. Um, he wanted to know if you'd be willing, can you share with us your overall theological, soteriological perspective? And after you answer that question, if you want to answer that question, feel free to just go right into the, um, any sort of other comments you'd like to make as far as the answer. Yeah. Sure. Um, Eric, there is some things at the beginning that I talked about. If you want to read more about me, I have on the website, if you go to www.beyondthefundamentals.com and scroll down just a little bit past the, uh, past the menu, there is a place where you can click on read more about Kevin and Paula. You can read more about me and my wife there, including my theological background, but I basically have a Baptist background, Southern and independent. And, um, I have not really had any inclination to stay with any kind within any kinds of denominational bounds since about 2018. Um, the theological soteriological perspective. We also presented that if you want a deep dive on that, there's a video we have called the name of Jesus and fractal salvation. And essentially Jesus is the ultimate 
savior of all things at every level. And there is no other salvation available outside of uh, Jesus Christ. And especially, especially the pattern of Jesus Christ as he has set it up. And we talked about that, how Jesus salvages every minute aspect of reality, not just, not just a person at conversion or their afterlife, but everything in between every breath we breathe, every molecule of every breath and everything that we do on the side. So with, you know, in, in closing, I'll say that I think a lot of people are in, in the chat on your side are not used to hearing someone talk like I have. And they're, they're basically exhibiting signs of being afraid of it. Oh, it's psychobabble. As soon as they don't understand something that's being said, they're going to map it to something that's got a negative label to it. And ultimately, if you could imagine debating Calvinism at certain, like a very superficial level, do you believe in Pauline predestination or Augustinian predestination? Do you, you know, just very, those very basic things. We could go back and forth on all those things all day long. Or, and those are very surface things, but there's, a, there's an underlying surface there is that people tend to align with propositional conclusions for reasons other than epistemic reasons. And this is what I have discovered as I have studied about these things uh, and why as, as they come down through the, there's like levels. And then under the in-groups, how, how is it that humans work? How do, our, how do our emotions play in to what we become persuaded about? And how long does that last? And why is it that we identify with sets of beliefs in such a way that cause us to go into fight or flight mode uh, when those beliefs are challenged, just like as if our life was physically threatened by an attacker or a wild animal or something like that? Your body starts to do the same thing. Is it healthy to be attached to such things like that? And I don't think it is. So why do we do that? Why? And what are our vulnerabilities as humans to be persuaded to aim for things we shouldn't aim for and to be attached to and to affirm things that we have no business doing and is affirming things the right thing for a Christian to do. Nobody in the New Testament is asked what they affirm. It's not that kind of thing, okay? And so what we should be aiming for is a, uh, there's a way of being. Jesus Christ is the way, and there's multiple times, there's like 18 times in the New Testament where, where Christianity is referred to as the way. It's a way, all right? It's not a set of beliefs, and those who have replaced Christ with a set of beliefs that they think are quote-unquote true, while they can't even give you the definition of what the word true means, are embedded very deeply in idolatry, and they're captivated by it and can't get out. And Therefore, as a Christ follower, when it comes to talking to that, you like, like me and CJ here, we're talking two different languages. We do not have a shared vocabulary. We do not have a shared perspective. And the goal of a fruitful discussion would not be to evaluate the correctness or incorrectness of what the other person is saying, but rather to first try to understand the perspective that's being presented and why it's being presented and why it's there. Okay. Um, one of the protocols we have at beyond the fundamentals for interacting with people is don't assume a shared uh, don't assume a shared vocabulary. So if we were to talk about things like, like when you say the word truth, we probably mean two different things by that. When we say the word believe, we probably mean two different things by that. When we say faith, we mean two different things by that. When we say the word, uh, predestination. We mean two different things by that. If we say sovereignty, we mean two different things by that. And so we don't have a shared vocabulary. And the level at which I am trying to approach things is what you might call as, as deep code as I can possibly reach for. I mean, there's a reason my channel is called Beyond the Fundamentals. I don't want to just scratch the surface. This isn't a milk ministry for people who uh, whatever, you know, who are like new to Christianity. This is the, this is the go down deep, stay down long, like really figure things out kind of stuff is what we're endeavoring to do. And therefore to, to go backwards and have a surface level conversation at the propositional conclusion level 
um, the very exercise is is disorienting to a degree. And so the, a good goal for a next conversation would be to find a way to find some proper orientation that a Christian should have in their life and being oriented toward getting the correct set of propositional conclusions to affirm and identify with and propagate and defend is fundamental disorientation is extremely profane and is one of the hugest problems institutional Christianity has to the degree where I would say that it is anti-Christian. All right. And then with that, and thank you for answering Eric's question there. And Eric, thank you also for uh, the super chat. Um, did you have any sort of last thoughts you wanted to give on the conversation before we uh, head out? I think I just gave, I'm, try, I'm trying to give people a sense of what I'm orienting toward or what I'm optimizing for. I mean, I do have a list in front of me. Like if we were to go, if we were to, you know, reduce the conversation, I have a list of 35 things that's wrong with Calvinism, but that's, I really, I don't really think it's fruitful to discuss things on those terms um, because it misses the point of where Christianity should be headed for in the first place. Um, so I'm, to me, Calvinists, provisionists, they're NPCs, non-player characters. There's nobody upstairs. There's nothing going on. Um, if I'm talking to a Calvinist, I might as well be talking to a computer or I'm, I'm talking to an avatar of an ideology. I'm not talking to, I'm talking to Pinocchio as a, as a puppet. I'm not talking to somebody who's become a real boy. There's no authenticity. There's no genuineness. And I've read the code. I used to be programmed by the code. So I basically don't have a lot of curiosity about other people who are also programmed by that same code. I would, I prefer to have conversations where we're trying to break new ground and understand something that isn't understood yet. So that's where I'm coming from. Website is beyond the fundamentals.com. YouTube channel is beyond the fundamentals. All right, and thank you very much for that. And so I'll end it with, I guess my final thoughts here being um, certainly I do uh, disagree with a lot of that. Right. But of course, that's why we're having this conversation to begin with. Um, I think this was uh, edifying in so much as that it did get to some of the uh, primary manners of thinking behind, you know, how I think of lordship and holiness and how you think of lordship and holiness. Of course, we only explored that one particular area of Calvinism, namely lordship. So if you wanted the conversation here on determinism or other sorts of questions there, uh, sorry, we did not end up getting there. But nevertheless, um, I think that this was a uh, fruitful conversation in at least that much. And I, I, I'm glad we were able to get a lot of the, the terms laid out here uh, very uh, plainly and bluntly. Also, Jamie and Iron Matt, thank you for your super stickers as well. Um so I'll end it by saying, I think that, uh, how do I want to put this? I think that these kinds of issues will ultimately only serve to, and, and these kinds of, and I'll rephrase that, these kinds of points only serve to obfuscate some of the truths that I think are relatively clear in scripture. Um, I think that a lot of times, um, you know, a lot of times people will, it's funny, Charlie's saying get off the air, but he's still here. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of times people will overcomplicate things that the Bible does not necessarily uh, wish to be complicated. There are complicated things there as well, but certainly, um, you know, the, the majority of things I think are, are not as complicated as we would like to make them. We have a tendency as human beings to want these things to be either deeper than they are or more complex than they are. Or, or something along those lines. And, and for the most part, I see scripture as a very plain document, the likes of which an Irish peasant farmer from the 1600s could understand just as well as an intellectual with PhDs in four different uh, uh, categories, right? Um, and so I, I would just want to implore people to understand plain the plain understanding of the text, the prima facie of the text, right? 
literalism is not always right, but literalist when the text wants to be understood in a literalistic fashion, we should take it that way. Um, and I guess I'll just kind of end with that there. So thank you guys for joining. If you like this video, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, hit the bell to get notified every time that we go live. And of course, uh, remember you can follow us on various social media platforms. I listed them at the beginning and you can contribute to what we do here in various different ways. Again, I listed them in the beginning. Um, we'll be back tomorrow for a, another conversation on free grace theology, namely moderate free grace theology, Lord willing. And, uh, yeah, um, Mr. Thompson, thanks. Very, thank you very much for joining us in the conversation here. Um, I definitely appreciate your time. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. God bless you guys. We love you in the Lord. And if he wills.